very esteemed panel. We're happy to have them. We are now open for any questions. If you want to post them in the chat or raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, and great screening. Um, so I think my biggest question I go back to is a very diverse uh, group that's being presented here, but who's not at the table, right? They said, who's not seeing the menu? Who doesn't get a voice? So where do you think those folks are? Who are they? What are they? What kind of characteristics do they have that would help us uh, identify them? Hi, everyone. The first, thank you for that question. The first thing that came to my mind is Black women. Black women need to be at the table. Um, and I say that because um, this year's United States Conversation of being Age, well, they love letters to Black women. And um, I tell people, uh, you know, people focus on LGBTQ, specifically men, gay men. Uh, there is a big number of Black women, cisgender and transgender, that are um, at higher rates of HIV at this moment. So I feel that that's one of the group of people that need to be on the team. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, great question. So I just wanted to share a little background on I think, this particular documentary project. So this was... Uh, funded and organized by the Chicago Film Public called in collaboration with the film production company. And as it is a multi-part series, part one definitely did focus on uh, featuring the stories of long-term survivors of HIV AIDS. The conclusion of Terry and I a bridging uh, conversations for the next part, which features Terry and Milani more, much more in focus, as well as others, which will be in part two. That said, we knew from the beginning of this project, there were already conversations that we knew that part one would feature stories from those who saw the beginning of the, the epidemic here locally. Um, but we knew that we wanted to bridge the conversation to those who are um, starting out in the field of HIV prevention and treatment. Um, and I think that uh, another voice that we've yet to hear from in, in these partic this particular documentary project um, are like youth voices that are disconnected from the field itself and not working in the field. It's not yet, right? Um, and I'm, I hope to see that happen in a future part three, but we'll see when, uh, when we get there, right? Hey, Adelaide. So really quickly, I kind of want to just add to that point. I feel as though I've been doing this work since I was 16 years old. The minute I went into a youth program and someone asked me my thoughts around HIV or I was asked to do a survey around like my sex usage. And I think that when we ask that question, like, who do we need at the table or things, I think that a lot of institutions do a lot of great research around youth and habits, but they don't actually give them seats at tables. I know that sounds very radical, but what does it look like to have a youth board that informs how an institution gives care to young people, you know, and that's something I've always tried to really push with a lot of the programming that I'm a part of, the work that I do, because I think that that is a voice that we often say we are looking for, or it's a hard to reach voice, and it's not really hard to reach for the people who are actually listening to that voice. Thank you, everyone. Any more questions in the room? Sorry for the people who might be hearing the microphone pops. Um, you know, I would just love to hear just about what being part of this film has meant for you all and, um, you know, why why you said yes and um, what's come out of it. And just I'm just curious about the entire experience. I might hear from me a lot, but you know, I like talking to y'all. So, um, 
like I said in the film, what brought me to uh, HIV work is the first person that ever treated me just like a person was my uncle and he died of AIDS complications. And I've been doing this work since I was first launched into a youth space and I needed youth like resources around housing, food, mental health services. I've done a lot out of this experience. I think that um, one, I'm in a place where in part two, I got to really figure out where I wanted to take myself in doing this work. Currently, I'm a uh, USC public policy student and I really do want to um, continue working in HIV policy and even how nonprofits are allocating resources uh, to people who are living with HIV because I think that Sometimes those policies often are barriers to care. Um, I have done stuff now. I do a social series for HIV Zero. If you are interested, yes, this is a shameless plug. Um, HIV Zero on Instagram. I do a, a Friday night conversation around HIV with my friends. It's literally people I know who have been working in HIV, people in community, and we have open conversations about what we are talking about in 2023 and HIV in our communities. And that's a huge space. I don't think that there's an open space where people just talk about like this cuffing season and how does that relate to like HIV, you know? And that stuff, that's actually our topic this Friday. So again, shameless blood. But like, I've gotten a lot of out of seeing my activism, not just the work that I do, but in how I show up in my community, how I show up for my community and I'm really proud of that, and that's something that I want to continue to do past this film. So, yeah. Ooh, this is a heavy question. So the reason I decided to be a part of this film was because um, I've been doing HIV work since 2008. For the first 10 years, I did it as an HIV negative person. For the last five years, as an HIV positive person. So I have the view as someone that's been on uh, used condoms, did all of that. And now I am a person with HIV navigating the system, navigating my own health. And I feel that stories like mine where, um, you know, mental health issues and other issues that will come out in the movie that I'm a little scared about coming out. Um, but I would... It, this is the most realist I've ever been in my life in this film. Um, but I also talk about the positive stuff, you know, family acceptance, um, how, you know, my, I have a huge support system. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I did um, decide to talk about, you know, a little more in depth was my mental health issues, which I'm still struggling. I literally just came out of the hospital two days ago which I'm thankful that I'm here right now. Um, and, you know, it's real, you know, just because I was, I've been doing this work for many years doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfectly okay for the rest of my life with being a treat positive because it's something that I'm, you know, it's only been five years, but every single day there's something different. There's different things that pop up that because of those experiences, I'm also able to navigate other people who are HIV positive into the public care. So my experiences, I take them and use it to my advantage to make sure that the people that I test and they test positive or test negative they need to get on prep. Like I've been there on both sides. So you know like it's important to share stories to you from someone who you know is undocumented. That's another thing that another thing that needs to be talk, talked about more, and the lack of access to people are documented, the numbers and the race and all of that. So yeah, there's a lot that I talk about in this film. Um, is important to obviously, but uh, yeah, the reason is I I needed to get this weight off my shoulder. Um, I couldn't just stand there and just pretend that. You know, on social media, going to this conference and getting this award and, you know, doing all these things. No, I'm talking about what happens to me behind the scenes. I'm not perfect. My health's not completely fine. It, 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 my, it's not a rainbow. You know, it's, it's sunshine, there's rain, there's thunderstorms. 
So that's the main reason why I wanted to share my story because I want to make sure that I share my story. Hopefully it helps other people get the help that they also need. Thanks, Terry and uh, Milani, for sharing um, your truths. And I'm so excited for part two. Um, yeah, I agree to be part of this film. Just so you know, so the invitation came for to most of us from Stanford, who was helping uh, CDPH and the film production company select speakers. Um, last year was a really busy year. There was a lot going on. And uh, the invitation to participate in the documentary came at a time when I had um, been really busy with this really exciting uh, campaign project to promote prep last summer in the middle of also trying to figure out how to get people vaccinated for Antox. Um, and I just appreciate the opportunity to spend time with a lot of individuals featured in the documentary that I consider my personal career, professional mentors, um, people I've worked with for in different ways, you know, in the last 10 plus years. Um, I There was so much material cut from the film too, it's such a short film given what how much footage was recorded, but um, I was very privileged to be in the room in the middle of the conversations we were having uh, there's this whole uh, lunch scene where we had a really good conversation, you know, but how do you take two hours and show it in two minutes? Um, so I just appreciated being you know, in the room with everyone in the mix. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to what you all shared in part two. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I, I just want to like also just, um, you know, I know how hard it is to like put your stuff up there and to be in front of ca the camera and to, to do all of that and for y'all to do that and to do that around like you know some some things that are just like some of the hardest things you're dealing with in your life i i just want you to to know that it definitely comes across in terms of you know this documentary is like um it makes you feel a, a lot about what it, what people are actually going through i think so oftentimes with HIV, I think people have become so uh, immune to the message or like just, you know, it's not talked about enough and it's sort of, it's not seen as like something that is impacting real people in the same way as maybe in the in the late 80s when, you know, it was much more sort of, you know, visible. And uh, I think stories like this are so important and just thank you for, for putting yourself out there and doing it because it really um, comes through. Um, I know personally just like seeing people that I know talking about these things, talking about their personal experiences in ways I don't get to hear it, seeing places I mentioned, like that I know um, mentioned. It just like, I, I, I think that films like this are so important in sort of making it real and igniting uh, a lot of uh, passion around this and enthusiasm. So I, I think you all are, yeah, part of something really special. Um, I just want to ask if other folks have any questions. I have plenty, so that's fine. But yeah. I was just going to ask what kind of community programs have you seen had the greatest impact in your experience? And kind of what kind of advice would you give to young people who wanted to get into this kind of activism and kind of involved with these community programs? Um, so, yeah, I think that you have to understand that like these are people who have real lives and going through real situations and they are also the experts of their situations um what got me into this work was my uncle's story but also i was a young person who was experiencing homelessness i also was one of the programs where people were as hiring me as like an intern to like be a part of your like youth internship program or whatever but i'm homeless like I don't know where I'm going to sleep, and it's been 
my life's work to push back against the idea of making young people work for free, especially young queer people. Young queer people are at higher risk of being like unstably housed and having support systems that do not look traditional like mom, dad, brother, sister. A lot of their tradition their support systems are people that they have to they have had to create. So with all of that knowledge, understanding that they are experts in what they need. Um, and you have to really lot rely on that like knowledge. Um, programs that I see really thrive in community is programs like Brave Space Alliance. I think that they are absolutely incredible because of the work they're doing. Something as simple as how they set up their pantry is they just don't get donated food. They go out and actually buy food and it's food that's fresh and not just donated, but it, that's just something huge for somebody like myself. Also still with like food instability. Um, there's another incredible person who's doing that on the South Side, Dion Dreams. Just had to plug him because he's incredible. But they are providing care on the South Side of Chicago to queer people in a way that is dignified, a uh, way that speaks to their experiences, even the idea of like, if you need a wig, you can just go in and just get one. That's something that's huge. Um, and it speaks to understanding people's experiences. So it's about building your agencies, your resources with those people in mind or those people who are saying, this is what you actually need. Maybe like, it's great to have this HIV test, please, like we need that. But if I don't know where I'm gonna lay my head at night, wouldn't it make more sense to like have this place where you can provide me a space where I'm, yeah, we're gonna see you here for the night, but also you just gotta take an HIV test for us. And I wish more agencies who were bigger would really start to rely on the idea that there's so many intersectionalities before we get to zero. So yeah. I, I believe, um into going into the community. When I'm talking about the community, I'm talking about like the West Side, the South Side, you know, all these neighborhoods where these small grassroots organizations, like you mentioned, Brace Peace Alliance, there's Life is Work, there's Calor, there's a whole bunch of organizations that are literally starting from the ground up that need these resources. We need people to come and you know, maybe volunteer or donate items. You know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of also like big organizations that got the coin, but there's other organizations that don't. So, you know, uh, for example, shameless plug. Um, every year I have a, an AIDS walk and run benefit show, um, which is happens to be this Sunday coming up at Hydra Night Club at 10 p.m. Um, which we raise money for the Chicago AIDS Walk and Run. Since Calor is part of is um, a partner of AIDS Foundation Chicago, whatever we fundraise, we get ninety percent back to us, which is amazing because we get to use that money to help you know the community. Um, and what I mean, the community is like when, for example, when COVID nineteen started, we were right. There next to in the church working on us doing COVID testing on one side, HIV testing on the other side. When M started, we did the same thing, doing providing vaccine on one side, HIV testing on the other. So it's you know, little realizing that little organ I shouldn't say little organizations, but grassroots organizations really looking at their work, studying their work. And that's how I got started. Like if, if people, you know, like I went to a youth group at Vida Sida, and little by little, I learned and look where I'm at now. Love those um, stories. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to echo that. Um, in terms of the original question, which is what, uh, what are examples that we've seen of effective community-based programming for HIV prevention and treatment? 
Um, I think I've seen a lot of different examples across Chicago um, over, over my you know time of volunteering, working, learning. And I really, a lot of the best work really does happen at the little funded, grassroots, community-based organizations. Um, and even though there is, there are city, county, and state dollars that we ask these organizations to compete for, um, sure, that funding exists, but there should also be like baseline, here's general operation funding that you don't have to compete for. It just comes with, hey, you got a competitive grant? Awesome, here's some extra cash to float you, because since we're gonna ask you to get reimbursed a year later, you know, for doing all this work. Um, and in my own work on like, you know, all the prep research we've done over the years, it would none of that would have happened without our ability to collaborate with community-based organizations like like Calor, like Corazon and Cicero, like Esperanza, like their FQHC system, Hard Grounds FQHC system, um, all of the Puerto Rican cultural you know, um, centers, organizations, Project Viva. None of the work that we do, the clinical prep research, treatment research that we do at the like, academic medical centers um, would really have taken place without strong relationships with community-based organizations. Um, and I would say that I saw examples too of times when those relationships were fostered and healthy and other times when they were abused and less healthy, right? Um, and I think that uh, where we're at today is recognizing um, how to make the best use of those relationships and support community-based organizations in doing their work and working together to do, move the needle forward. I think this is a really good transition into something I'm, I, I really wanted to ask everybody here is, you know, we are at an academic institution, we're at Northwestern here, and I would just love to um, hear more about, you know, you know, academic institutions have so much power and privilege in terms of resources. How do we do a better job of partnering with the community? Um, what are the tangible sort of steps that we can do to build these relationships and to support these relationships? for people to go to school. Okay, let me unpack this real quick. So I worked in one of the largest nonprofits in the Midwest. I worked there for five years. I got up to a level where I was training other people in different agencies how to conduct HIV screenings, blood draws, STI counseling sessions, everything. That means absolutely nothing if I don't have a degree. That means absolutely nothing if I don't have a degree. I think that there's this misconception that if you work in nonprofit, that you are doing well and you know you just really care about community, which yeah, I do, but there's also a ceiling that you get to where you will get to a point of just tokenizing your certain employees because they are great at what they do, but you will never hire them as managers because they don't have a degree. I think what academic institutions can do is provide pathways to degree programs for community health workers who are health educators, who are people who are who've just been screening uh, in community for HIV tests for the last two years, three years, five years, ten years, because those are the experts. When people talk about those hard, those hard to reach populations and communities, they're not hard to reach for people like. It is debilitating to see our work kind of get just kind of trampled a lot of times with people who do come in and have the degrees and things like that, but we know the community and our opinions are not validated. So I think that that's a huge part of it. It's also very interesting that we live in a city like Chicago that has so many nonprofit programs that are fighting so many 
great issues, but they don't have any connections to universities where their workers can go and actually get something more than just a license or certificate. Like, what does it look like saying that we will, because you are working at a Howard Brown or because you are working at a Calor or Brave Space Alliance and you are working in community, we will pay for you to go to our School of Public Health because you show us that you are part of working in community. And as a student at UIC, I am pushing that in all of my policy conversations. And also, work, I, work at a, I work at the University of Chicago. I also work at UIC. I always say this all the time. I work at two of the largest universities here in Chicago, and no one wants to pay for me to go to school. And I've been doing this work since I was 19. I'm 30 years old now. So... It's not that I don't want to go to school. It's not pe that people from my community don't want that extra level of education. It doesn't exist for us. And you can say in scholarships, you could say that there's programming, but what does it look like for a Northwestern to partner with a Howard Brown and say, because you have employees here, we want to get them certified to do more than this and move up and actually maybe come into work for uh, Northwestern for our university and inform how we do work, you know? So... I will always preach that. I will always put that out there because I truly believe that is not the only answer, but it is a very good solution to some of that. Some of that. So yeah, I totally agree with you. I was. I want to use an example. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was working at at VNC, at the Green Culture Center, I actually met Greg. I've worked with Greg and Dr. Green. Um, but unfortunately, in the middle of working with the project, with the partnership, I stopped working there and, you know, I, I lost touch. But what I'm trying to say is that I wish that universities like, like these that do partner with small community-based organizations that not just give the funding for these partnerships, but like you said, find a way to look at these people that are doing the grassroots work and helping with these research projects to help them pay for school, give them a scholarship, you know, create programs. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, here because a master's degree, you know, but, you know, try to find a way to um, reward those people that are doing the work in the community because y'all need us. Um, absolutely, right? I think that, I think that, um, I'd like to believe that a lot of us want to support that kind of pathway. And I think the challenge we had before us is figuring out how to make that happen. Um, I think over the years that I was at, um, at Comedy, as, you know, figuring out staffing on research grants, the challenge I think is, it's the larger institutions that have the funding to provide some amount of professional development, funding, some amount of tuition reimbursement if you're connected to an academic institution. And it's the, you know, the, it's the community-based organizations and the grassroots organizations that don't have the funding to provide that as part of like their benefits packages. And so those employees lose out on tuition reimbursement or other professional development opportunities. But there should be some way to bridge that um, through partnerships with academic institutions. And I think the other challenge is, um, you know, what does it mean to hire someone on what you know to be a one-year soft money grant and uh, provide them with a meaningful learning opportunity within that one to five-year grant? I don't think it's insurmountable, but I think it's a challenge that we should take on. So, uh, And it's work that. I know we want to do so, um, but thank you for igniting some some passion because it's it's important. We need to support folks and moving along their professional pathways of, of their choice. To that point, it is happening. Other institutions are actually trying to figure this out. I am a student at UIC. And I'm part of a fellowship called Life Scholars, and they are taking people who are community health workers who work in community and trying to figure out like pathways like 
getting us through school. Like I'm in my junior year and like I'm graduating very in, uh very very so it's not that institutions are so large and so big that I don't believe that. And I and I I'm I am in agreement with you too that like it's all about like how do we figure that out? And I really do think it takes a dedicated team of people to also understand that there are things that like a traditional support systems, hey, what does it look like if we have to house a student for four years in an apartment that is all their own because they don't have anywhere to go in the summertime? I think that like it is having really radical, hard conversations that push back against institutional norms. So yeah, sorry. Other questions? One thing that I heard repeated a couple of, oh, sorry, do we have any online? Oh. Um, one thing I, I heard repeated a couple of times and I want to touch, touch on is just, you know, documentaries focused on HIV, but this is not the only pandemic that these communities are going through, have gone through. Um, we have COVID, we have MPOX also. Um, what, I guess, have we learned? What have we not learned? And what, and it continues? Um, I don't know if you have any. One thing I've noticed about that, um, if you look at the charts of HIV, COVID-19, and MPOX, they're almost identical. They're almost identical, like, unfortunately. And one of the reasons I believe that is because of lack of health care for communities of color. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, the numbers of people on PrEP who have, who's mostly on PrEP, white people, the Latinx people, and Black and African Americans. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people working in nature prevention field did when COVID first started, we already knew what to do because a lot of us, you know, have been doing similar work. People were panicking just like in the beginning of the HIV epidemic. The same feelings that we all had with COVID-19 started is the same feeling that people at the beginning of HIV epidemic. Same thing with the exact same thing, same feelings. What do we know about it? We don't know much about it. How can we do something about it? So the similarities are there. The similarities are there in communities of color, which is why more funding needs to go to these communities of color. Well, um, one thing I saw now, it was very interesting because um, I saw a couple of things happen during COVID that I wasn't alive during the start of the AIDS epidemic, but I can speak to just my knowledge around it. Living through like um, COVID, one thing I saw was the immediate like rush to have a bunch of resources in the agency that I worked for go directly to the North side. I saw that the agency that I worked for that had spaces on the South side got COVID tests late, got information about how to screen for COVID late, um, how transmission happened very late versus when I worked in the, I, they moved me around, when I worked in the clinics up north, it was very, you have to wear this, you have to, like, there was very much, like, touch it, you know, and I think that is how we treat public health just as a society, especially it's the idea that black and brown people don't care about their health. And that is simply untrue. We do not provide spaces for them to be educated about healthcare risks. We don't even educate the people in their spaces about the risk that they are at. And one thing I did see when COVID went up was a large amount of people who worked in those clinics getting sick with the population of people who needed to be served. And I look at how things like work remote was this very polarizing idea of, oh, you must not care about your job if you don't want to come to work. And these people are saying, you won't even pay us hazard pay. And we are 
literally at risk. I'm asthmatic and I did not get the option to not work remote at all. Like I was told that like I had to, not told I had to suck it up, but like told in a way that you don't really need to work remote. You know, you just want to work remote. And no, but that's me advocating for my hope as a black person versus I have to say if I had white skin and I said that and then had the option to take it up to HR, it would have been a different conversation. So I think that it is truly the way we put those like those fielders out there and how like I just saw like this idea that like we have to protect this one space and then then we'll get to this other space. And I think the same thing happened with HIV, where we see that now black and brown men are well, black men specifically are seeing as at a higher rate of transmission than we see anybody else. And even how we've educated about PrEP, I'm glad we live in an age of injectable PrEP. I advertise it, I talk about it a lot because I am like a person that gets it now. And I think that like that is a test. I wanted to be a part of that first wave because I'm like, I've seen how traditionally Black folks have been left out with these new advancements when it comes to treatment, especially with HIV. Oh, I love that you just said that. And the reason I love you just said that is because I was just at the U.S. Conference on HIV and AIDS two weeks ago. I did a presentation. One of the things that I mentioned was about all the abundance of HIV resources that are on North Hospice on Boys Town. Girl, there's too many. And there is not enough in the, in the south side and in the west side. So one of the things that I said is one of the strategic that, strategies that uh, Calor did is we did not wait for clients to come to our office. We didn't wait for, for the community to come to us. We literally packed our van. We literally some tents. We went to the churches, to the parking lots, to the parks, to anywhere that which we can set up shop, COVID testing on one side, HIV on the other. Because like you said, same thing with MPOX, we were pissed. We were pissed that there were so many lines outside Steamworks, so many lines outside a lot of the clubs in North Hosted, and where were, and here's the thing, the people that live around there are the ones that are gonna get in line first to get the MPOX vaccine. The people that live, in the north side, I mean the west side and south side, by the time they get there, there's no more vaccines. And you see you, so you see the you see the problem there. That's why we need to make sure that we look at where we take these resources. It can't just be in the one neighborhoods. I don't remember the question. <laughs> but um but thank you for sharing both of your um, perspectives. I feel uh, that um, you know, just given like the nature of the documentary to focus on getting to zero, the journey towards zero around HIV, um it's such a fascinating topic because it makes you think about all the intersecting diseases like COVID and like black like pox, exactly to your point, Milani, that they continue to affect the same, not only geographic communities, but racial and ethnic communities, sexual and gender minority communities, for all the same reasons, right? Uh, not enough access to quality health care, quality you know, opportunities for educational advance, opportunities for livable wages, uh, jobs that you can live off of, um it's all the same like mix of issues and what i think about in terms of like what's going to get us towards closer to zero closer to ending this epidemic um we need to start working at those root level structural problems and i know that there's a lot of like scams focusing on one issue at a time, but we need to do more work across our agencies, right? Um, and in one, you know, just to call back to what we were talking about earlier, um, 
so much of this work is happening at the community-based organization level. Like we need to find ways of not only supporting those agencies, but the people working there. Um, and that's just a comment that I'll end on. And I know that we need to move on, but. Thank you all so much. That was a really fantastic conversation. Um, it, can we give everybody just a round of applause? Um, so now we are going to um, show the, this part two trailer. Um, maybe we can kind of reconfigure. Um, and then we are going to also send out an evaluation. So let us know how this event was. And um, hopefully we'll be having it in a few months, part two. So folks in the room, I think there's a QR code floating around. So you can complete that. Here we go. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, the Harris Theater. From five to nine, and if you want your tickets, you can go to. Um, oh yeah, if you want tickets, you can go to journeytozero.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Their tickets are going to release next week, so you can get free tickets. There's like a six hundred like limit, but they're going to go fast, so definitely get sign up for those tickets, real soon. Thank you. HIV does not define who you are as a person. It's a lot of unlearning, a lot of people have to do. Getting to zero would be amazing. I hold your hand, you hold mine, and we all come together when it comes to this. I'm living proof that HIV could happen to anyone. You can be a doctor, you can be a specialist, you could, you know, know everything that you can know about HIV and AIDS, and you can still catch it. HIV doesn't have a specific name, doesn't have a specific community, it doesn't have a specific type. I've worked with a population of people who experience a lot of homelessness, who are young, who are living with HIV, and how do they stay undetectable if they don't have access to proper housing? The numbers are there. The rates for, for Black and Latinx folks getting HIV is at a higher rate than, you know, white folks. Even people on PrEP is the opposite. White people are the ones that are the mostly on PrEP, then come Latinx folks, then come Black and African Americans. I just want to get more facts on something that I learned. Like, what happens if a person is resistant to Travada and I have sex with them, but I'm taking Travada for prep? Like, how does that work? We are so afraid of the truth. The truth is a lot of our biggest insecurities. I accepted I was positive. I accepted I wanted to live. I don't want my mom, like, over my casket saying, what could I have done? differently. I do hope that we are going to get to zero, <laughs> but it's not going to happen overnight. Even when we talk about like getting to zero, I'm homeless and you want me to stay in care and stay on my meds. Prep means nothing to people who are homeless, to someone who's living on survival sex. Mother. Mm. The power of makeup, darling. You feel fierce. You feel lovely. You feel like a woman. You've been with a deep ass voice. <laughs> oh. See, there she is. She's been found. She's no longer lost. She is ready.
And thank you to our Connect and Edit programs for organizing. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to check our website for more information about our upcoming events. Our next current issues will be October 12th. So please join us then.